Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Fighting Neighborhood Decay from Blight to Bright Web Seminar. I'm Michelle Thompson, an Economic Development Associate at IEDC, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. We have a great lineup of speakers who will share with you strategies for addressing blight in your communities. Um, but before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. During the webinar, we'll have all lines muted. So please type all of your questions into the questions box and I'll pose them to our speakers during the Q&A period. Within 24 hours, you'll receive an email with an electronic evaluation. We ask that you please complete it as IED staff does use the feedback to plan future sessions. Uh, furthermore, you'll receive a link to download presentations at the end of the evaluation. So this time, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Diane Lucky. Uh, Diane is the president of Lucky and Associates out of Wisconsin. Um, and she's also um, been one of our uh, trainers, um, instructors for our training course, Neighborhood Development Strategies. Um, so we're real glad to have Diane here today. Uh, Diane, would you like to share some information about yourself with our audience? Well, you're doing a good job so far, but um, I am a consultant, a long-term consultant, uh, actually just past 28 years of consulting. I've been very fortunate in my career uh, to do work I love all around the country in neighborhoods, downtowns, and rural places. I'm pleased to be here today. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. So without further delay, Diane, um, I turn the seminar over to you. Perfect. Thank you. The role that I'm gonna to play today with um, the course is to give you uh, a bit of an introduction about neighborhoods and, and blight, uh, some context, an approach and a strategy, and then I'm gonna end with a few examples of how other communities have worked to make their communities look better, feel better, and also work better economically. Together with Bill and Bali, we're gonna share you so, uh, share with you some of the same high content um, that you'd gain from the neighborhoods course. Not all of it, but a little snippet. Uh, we talk about that in terms of ideas, those ideas that you can begin implementing today, data that you need to support that kind of investment, and thirdly, the tools that you need to make it happen. In terms of context, I think it's important to talk about um, really what is economic development? And from a neighborhood's perspective, uh, sometimes we think about it a little bit differently. We think about it in terms of, of a process, uh, but it's really all about building wealth. It's about building wealth. And because this is such long-term work, it's important that you switch your focus from the way we usually think about economic development in terms of job creation to thinking about wealth building. Because automatically, if you think about wealth building, you're thinking about what's sustainable over the long term. Another word about um, approach is that, you know, we live in a, in a time that is, um, there's enormous change. And change has always been difficult for individuals and for communities. And today that change is lightning fast. So we need ways to think about how to make that change more comfortable. And how do we also manage that change for our communities? How do we create and capture value in the future for our neighborhoods? We do that by thinking about um, change in terms of transformation, not just fixing something that's wrong, but how do we change um, our thinking to look at a longer term, look at transformation? And you start down that path by thinking big, starting small, and acting fast. Why do we need to talk about blight? Why is it that uh, down at the heels building um, is a separate issue from overall economic development? Well, that's because um, a store, whether it's a storefront, a housing block, or a shopping center, um, those buildings, when they're blighted, tend to defy overall trends. They tend to be resistant to change, and they also tend to persist, um, kind of as a nagging ache. And it's indicative of something else that's going on in your community, something that's really not quite right, a little off balance. So we need to think about this in terms of a different strategy. We've known for a long time that thriving downtowns and neighborhoods support thriving regional economies. 
and neighborhoods and downtowns in distress undermine our overall economic development efforts. We've also known that blight has a strong association with poverty. What we haven't really understood about that is that there are consequences for those living in areas of blight for long periods of time. To get a better handle on that, I really like the work that um, Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hendren have been doing in Milwaukee as well as around the country, where they have calculated and mapped the impact of any given geography on, a long, on, their, on its long-term income potential. So what I'm saying is that simply growing up where you land may add or subtract 5, 10, or 15 percent of your potential income. That can be grim for an individual or, or, a, or a free bonus, but it can be grim for an individual, but it also you have to think about this in terms when, in neighborhood development that it lim limits the overall wealth potential for the community as a whole. So that you can get a better handle on some of these ideas, I think it's helpful to look at a couple different sources that you might be able to add to the kinds of data collection that you're doing already. These will help you to better understand your situation and they'll also help you tell your story more compellingly. The first of these I want to talk about is uh, Opportunity 360. And uh, I like this because it is, well actually I like both of the, the recommendations because they're really visual and they help you to tell a, your story in a more vibrant way. Uh, but the first here, uh, Opportunity 360, focuses on data and metrics to measure economic opportunity. And the second that I want to suggest to you is uh, Stats America. And this is probably one you're familiar with, but I, I encourage you to spend a little more time working with it because it includes um, data sources and tools that we're already familiar with, like the location quotient, cluster mapping, that sort of thing. Um, but it's in an easier to use format. Uh, um, I'm not going to say easy easier, I'll say easier to use format, and it provides a better display for you and therefore a more compelling story that you can tell about your community. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about strategy. We all want our communities to look better and feel better, but we also want them to be better. What is it that we can do to make our neighborhoods look better today, but then also have the staying power to actually make them better economically tomorrow. This suggests a two-tier strategy, and we call that zoom in, zoom out, and it actually has four steps. Starting with zoom out, this is where you're thinking big, where you're looking out 10 to, 50, 10 to 20 years. It, it's your long view for the neighborhood. What do you see for the neighborhood in the long term? That second strategy is where you, you focus in, you zoom in, what you're looking for is what, it, what is it that you can do that is discrete? And it's something that would provide a quick win and it's something that you can learn from. So you might be starting with uh, a storefront or an alleyway or a vacant lot or, or just some outside beautification, but it's something, something very small that's gonna give you that quick win, um, but it also it's, it's instructive for you and for those working with you. The third strategy is a niche strategy. Now what you're trying to do is build on what you've done, look for areas of competitive advantage, things that are unique uh, or concentrated assets that others can't copy before you can gain traction. So it's a niche strategy. It's a small piece, but it's something that, that, that adds on to what you're already doing. Finally, in the fourth phase, these are complementary strategies. Here what you're doing is you're broadening who's involved, who's engaged, who's participating, and encouraging them to work independently or in collaboration to follow your lead or another complementary path. Zoom in, zoom out. Now I'd like to turn to some examples. I had a great time last, last summer um, uh, working in Searcy, Alabama and Minneapolis. And uh, I would just wanted to mention a couple of things that are going on there that I was really, really impressed with. The three pictures to your left, to the left of your screen, are from Searcy. And um, they were really struggling with their downtown. Um, it was blighted, as they say. Uh, lots of vacant storefronts, lots of building that, buildings that needed a, 
um, needed a facelift, uh, needed to, to just look better. Uh, the chamber, the Main Street, uh, Main Street Circe, and uh, some individuals got together and decided that the best way to start was to just make it, make it look better. So really they started with paint. So paint was really their strategy. How do we make this place look better? The amazing thing is just with paint, they were able to do this um, in a very short period of time before they were even done with, with uh, doing sort of the paint up fix up of their area. By the way, these buildings were uh, vacant at the time. Um, they immediately saw an uptick in sales. They saw interest in vacant buildings and storefronts in the downtown and renewed, renewed interest in investment all around. A byproduct of that was the second, um, the, the second and third pictures uh, in the middle of your screen. Uh, that's a company called Think Graphics. They decided they were gonna purchase a building in the downtown and relocate their business into those buildings. They did a very cool renovation. Um, the upper picture is the offices on the inside. Uh, so they broke up this building and directly across from this, this wall of glass offices is their kitchen. And that's the lower picture there. It's kind of a bar style kitchen. And if you look real closely, those are swing set um, seats that they're using for seats in the kitchen. So it's actually a, a very cool building, a fun project. And it was the, an example of a good complementary strategy to the overall strategy they were doing in the downtown. On the far right is um, uh, another kind of quick start kind of strategy, and that's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, this is in an old um, industrial area. Um, and this is uh, one of those old, dark, ugly, scary alleys that they've transformed into uh, a wonderful walkway and connector piece uh, rather than a divider uh, within the community. Uh, simply by putting, doing a little bit of paving, uh, turning those side entry entryways into um, front door style entries with awnings and porches. Uh, it's really been a nice transformation. The next thing I want to talk about are a few um, niche strategies in evidence in Bay City, Michigan and uh, Water, Valley, Water Valley, Mississippi. The um, the two pictures on the outside of your screen, Elaine's Bake Shop and the one on the far right, which is a corridor shot, those are both from the city market in Bay City. That's a project of the Chamber, um, Main Street Bay City, the uh, and the Visitor Center. It is, uh, they've taken a, uh, an old vacant um, uh, department store and turned that into, turned the, that main floor level, the entire main floor level into a city market and it has really been an, uh, turned into an anchor rather than a blight on that uh, downtown block and has also been uh, a great uh, entrepreneurship strategy for them. A lot of these are startups uh, and one location businesses, so it gives them an opportunity to test out the market uh, and then potentially move to other places. The center picture there is uh, in Water Valley, Mississippi, and this is another example of, of individuals uh, taking a complementary strategy, seeing opportunity and purchasing a building, uh, renovating that building and uh, being able to, to, to put in the building things that they've noticed that are missing in the community, in this case, um, uh, small grocery items and specialty goods. This is another great example of a complementary strategy. Uh, cooperatives and uh, employee stock ownership programs, uh, ESOPs, and other related models or uh, ownership models are not really new. In fact, they've been around for, for a century at least. Um, but they are really have been gaining traction recently, um, not just as employment models, but also as place-based strategies for neighborhood and community development. I'd encourage you to take a look at this Cleveland model. What they are doing is uh, setting up a series of individual uh, worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, they have three set up now, the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, uh, Evergreen Energy Solutions, and Green City Grocers. Um, uh, as far as I know, all three are now profitable uh, as, as businesses and for their, uh, and for their individual individual owners. 
and they're beginning to anchor the communities in which they they are operating. So uh, there's a lot of information online about the Cleveland model. So I'd encourage you to look at the Cleveland model. This is um, uh, this particular slide came through the um, uh, their graphic at least came through the uh, Democracy uh, Collaborative, but there are quite a few other sources of information on the Cleveland model. You also might take a look. It's it's quite interesting. It's had uh, a uh, good impact so far, the Preston model in the UK. Um, there's some question about whether uh, the Preston model is following Cleveland or whether Cleveland's following the Preston model, um, but both of them um, are having some good impact in their communities. Finally, I wanna talk ab about uh, St. Louis and a really big, really long view vision um, in the, uh, uh, sorry here, just forgot my two communities. Um, oh, it's the historic Central West and Forest Park neighborhoods. It all started over on the far um, left side of your screen in the, in the bottom left-hand corner there is the Doris Motor Car Company. Uh, Doris Motor Car Company uh, built cars in this neighborhood um, the photo that you see there is from 12, um, uh, 1906, and they actually were building hand-built cars for a very discerning market. Uh, the, build, the company uh, ended in bankruptcy in 1926. Uh, the building housed some other businesses, but really remained vacant for decades. Uh, it was a blighted, a blighted facility for this neighborhood. And the community had a vision, um, a, a long-term vision for a biotech, bioscience, research development, commercialization kind of community. And that first project was the Doris Motor Car Company. It was an $8 million project. If you look in the upper left of your slide, that is the uh, building as it is, uh, as it is today. Uh, $8 million, 12 different sources of funding, and it really kicked off, it anchored that neighborhood and kicked off the entire um, project, as you can see in the right-hand part of your slide in that, in that map. The most recent project that is now underway is $170 million, and that $170 million includes apartments, um, a new hotel, and a metro link to the airport. It is a great project, it's, one, it's a wonderful example uh, first on how hard it is to get started, but on how over time it really makes uh, a great impact um, for the community. If you have that big vision, if you start small um, and act fast. I have just a few more thoughts for you um, in summary. And, and that's to, to focus back on building wealth. So, so think about this in terms of wealth building Use that zoom in, zoom out strategy. It's a really good uh, uh, sort of overall model and will fit with whatever kind of planning you're doing. Broaden your thinking on who's involved. Um, simple is always best, but don't be afraid of that complex funding. And once you put that, that one complex project together, everything else is gonna be easier. Think big, start small, act fast. Contact me if I can help you. I look forward to chatting. Thanks, Diana. It was a wonderful presentation. And yes, we also look forward to chatting with you later during our Q&A segment. Um, so thanks. Um, next, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Bill Taft. Uh, Bill is the program vice president and Indianapolis director for the Local Initiative Support Corporation, otherwise known as LISC. And Bill has been instrumental in leading efforts uh, to expand LIST economic development um, initiatives nationally. So welcome, Bill. Would you like to share some information about yourself today with our audience? Yeah, thanks for having me. I uh, also just want to say that I'm gonna, my goal is to really pick up on um, some of the ideas that Diane brought up and talk about how those have uh, played out here in Indianapolis. I've been working in uh, neighborhood development since 1991 here in Indianapolis and starting out as a CDC director and then working for LISC and now increasingly working at the national level with LISC. So uh, I think it's uh, this sort of zoom it in, zoom out uh, kind of approach is what I've been doing. 
Well, great, Bill. Well, at this time, we'll now turn the seminar over to you. Great. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, how Indianapolis has addressed some of the challenges that it shares with a lot of other uh, Midwestern cities in particular, and this idea that uh, a lot of our traditional uh, economic base, um, particularly manufacturing, uh, has really kind of evaporated over the last 30 years, and uh, which has led to a, a pretty successful transition in some ways as a region um, to different types of industries, but many of the neighborhoods, particularly the, the core center city neighborhoods of the city of Indianapolis, have really struggled to um, recover from that, and that's a challenge for the entire city. And what I'm going to do is talk about really uh, uh, three ways that we've approached um, this kind of disinvestment and blight uh, at, the, at the community level here. Uh, with the help of, of national groups uh, partnering with community-based organizations. Sorry. The, uh, so LISC is a, uh, as a national nonprofit. It's actually the largest community development nonprofit in the country. Uh, we have been working for about 35 years uh, in, we have work in 32 different cities. Uh, here in Indianapolis, we've been here 25 years. We've invested directly almost a billion dollars. Uh, and uh, we are, um, we really have this interesting model that is very locally driven as far as strategy, but we have access to national tools to implement that strategy. Um, in Indianapolis, we, we are part of a, a consortium of organizations that are working to implement community development, and we recently revisited this. What are we really ultimately trying to accomplish as a community? And this is a mission statement that essentially says um, we want to uh, strengthen the opportunity, livability, and fiscal health of the city, and that this is essential to have a strong city for community development to actually work. And will there never be enough philanthropic or government money to make this happen? We have to um, engage the market in reinvesting in these communities. And the goal of our efforts is to do that, but for the benefit of the people who live there today, but also people in the future. There's some basic principles we've learned through the years uh, for this kind of work. One is that we really need to engage the neighborhood. Uh, this is not something you can do to a neighborhood. The neighborhood has to lead this work. Uh, we have to align many different kinds of resources. There's no one uh, pot of funding or technical expertise that is sufficient to transform a, a disinvested neighborhood. It has to be alignment of many different players and many different resources. We have to reinforce the unique assets of that community. Every community has assets, so the goal is to identify those and build on those invest in the infrastructure of how these organizations actually in these places work so a civic infrastructure of that community is important for its long-term health and then integrate into the, the larger economic development system of our region uh, we we don't create the regional economy the goal is to help our neighborhoods identify how they participate um, in that regional economy both to the benefit of the neighborhood and as well as the benefit of the region the, uh, one, the first neighborhood I'm going to talk about is Fountain Square. It's uh, on the southeast side of downtown. It was cut off from downtown and cut through the center by the construction of the interstate system uh, in the early 1970s. And really that put the neighborhood into a tailspin. It was always a blue collar neighborhood, uh, and, uh, it was an, but that really led to a loss of many homeowners and disinvestment in businesses, et cetera. Um, and obviously, they were, it was part, that was part of an overall suburbanization happening in our city and all over the country. Um, one of the things that's unique about this neighborhood in Indianapolis is it still has a, uh, a, a historic commercial center that the neighborhood is built around, and uh, that is a potential asset. And then also, this is a neighborhood that got organized and early on created the first quality of life plan in the city, and that really. Um, has been the game plan for the revitalization of that community by community-based organizations. Uh, uh, this is not a neighborhood that was prioritized by city government or by a major foundation. It was a community that really uh, started the, the effort and then was able to attract partners in moving that forward. The uh, 
one of the things that's been a, a, a way that they've been able to attract interest is, is playing up on an asset, which is this great history of, of historic buildings and a unique sense of place because of that. Ultimately, they've tapped into the arts as a way to uh, change how people perceive that commercial area and uh, to give it a cool factor that then attracted other kinds of investment. They also really focused on tackling several big white elephant buildings in that neighborhood that were really inhibiting people investing in the smaller buildings because they sat there empty. Uh, that they focused on the commercial center uh, with the theory that that would also attract um, more residents. Um, it has a challenge in both its housing and commercial, but that, that the unique nature of that commercial center, if it was active, uh, would attract residents. Um, they also emphasized um, that this that this revitalization would benefit long-term residents um, in, a, in an equitable way. And then also, um, they they really took a slow approach of many small components adding up to over $50 million over about a 15-year period invested in this uh, revitalization. Uh, this is just a picture of the couple of the historic buildings in the commercial center that had been very deteriorated, but remained real assets in the sense of their presence, their, their uh, the kind of cool factor they could bring. Um, the on one, one specific building that was revitalized is uh, an old the Wheeler Shebler Carburetor Company. That was where one of the founders of the Indy 500 um, had his business that made carburetors for many historic uh, cars. Went out of business long ago. Many other factories had followed, but then it was sitting empty and deteriorated. Ultimately, the, the Community Development Corporation, Southeast Neighborhood Development, led the revitalization and, the, and turned this into 36 live work lofts for low income artists using the low income and, and historic preservation tax credits. Uh, and also a partnership with a nearby anchor institution, the University of Indianapolis, to run cultural programs in the common spaces. Now, their partnership with the, that same university was to create a primary care center that was essentially acted like a teaching hospital and uh, where their students would work side by side with doctors and uh, social workers and, and uh, really at a place called Southeast Community Services uh, and, and also helped fund the expansion of that building led by the CDC developing that. Uh, the CDC also renovated about 150 houses in the neighborhood and restarted what was pretty much a dead home ownership market um, where values were extremely depressed and basically uh, those 150 houses are mostly for low to moderate income buyers, but it also then triggered market rate investment in the area. Because of this investment, it attracted um, attention uh, and was designated one of the cultural districts of the city. And uh, when this uh, concept was being developed called the Cultural Trail, which is a landscaped, um, uh, beautiful connection uh, from of all the downtown cultural assets, Fountain Square was the farthest out element that was connected into that, and then that has just accelerated this investment. So the, that's one example of basically a neighborhood-driven, kind of one-off, slow renovation uh, that was effective here. But we, we have many other neighborhoods that are suffering from the same challenges. And so um, in 2007, uh, there was a push to um, take some of these lessons of comprehensive community development and apply them in more neighborhoods. And it became the Great Indy Neighborhoods Initiative. And there were six neighborhoods selected to create what we call quality of life plans, which is a way that the community gets together, the key stakeholders of residents, businesses, uh, government representatives, um, faith-based community, et cetera, getting together to shape a five-year agenda. And uh, one of the and, and to basically uh, identify where they want to get to, but how community-based actors are going to drive that work. Uh, that, this process happened in all six of the great um, the Great Indy Neighborhoods Initiative communities, but was particularly um, powerful on the Near East Side. Uh, this na neighborhood had suffered from lots of foreclosure and disinvestment, but it, um, one, one, as they were finishing up their plan, uh, Indianapolis was submitting its bid for the 2012 Super Bowl, and this we they were looking for some kind of legacy benefit to that to the larger city of us hosting the Super Bowl. And so we pitched the idea to the, the bid committee that they make this the legacy project, adopting a neighborhood. They selected the Near East Side, and over the next three years, there was an ongoing partnership between the host committee after we were selected and uh, this neighborhood implementing their vision for their neighborhood with lots of outside partners excited by the Super Bowl connection. So over that um, three-year period, there was $160 million of investment. 
um, there was um, 290 units of housing developed, uh, investment into income and asset development through Centers for Working Families, uh, commercial district revitalization, educational programs, and a variety of other things. If somebody was doing something exciting in Indianapolis at the neighborhood level, they did it in this, this neighborhood because of the Super Bowl connection. So there was capital investment. There was, um, as I said, in investment in a new model for neighborhood, I'm sorry, for income and asset development for low-income families. There was investment in um, economic development in a commercial district. Uh, there was investment in education. And all of this added up to just a, a dramatic improvement in the quality of life in that community. Many volunteers participated in this. Uh, it included infrastructure improvements, as I said, housing improvements, multifamily development um, for both market rate as well as much affordable housing constructed. This was all occurring during the, the, uh, the recession. So um, really was a challenging time, but many, much work was accomplished. This is a the Chase uh, Near East Side Legacy Center, which is a partnership uh, using the New Markets tax credit to create a recreational center for this community on the campus of a historic high school, but used by all generations. Um, and ultimately, this initiative, this um, this momentum led to the uh, the designation of this area as a promise zone. Um, this neighborhood has really continued to show it works well together with many different organizations. It's a large area, has about uh, the promise zone has about 40,000 people in it, so it's a good size population covered by that. Uh, many sort of sub neighborhoods within that. Uh, one of those um, sub neighborhoods was successful in. in being included in our next iteration of comprehensive neighborhood development called Great Places 2020, but also many other positive things happening. Um, and one of those is that there are two uh, historic industrial areas that, that parallel railroad lines through these areas. And Indianapolis had historically not paid much attention to reactivating its historic industrial areas. Because we have Unigov, our entire county is the city. Um, there was much open space for industrial uh, expansion up, up until quite recently. And so um, it, there was not the typical political pressure for urban um, uh, industrial revitalization that some cities have that don't have that room for expansion. So um, from this process, we realized these were really underperforming areas. They were negatively affecting the adjoining neighborhoods, but had the potential to create jobs, bolster tax base, and really uh, accelerate the other kinds of investment in those communities and so we have launched a partnership called fostering commercial urban strategies um, with many different local partners to reinvest in these commercial industrial areas as well um, and those are both in the promise zone another thing as i mentioned earlier is the center for working families this is a, um, a holistic approach of working with low-income families to bring to bolster their income and assets but what it's really become is a gateway into our workforce development system and really, all of this leads up to a broader approach that we are now deploying uh, locally and increasingly nationally in LISC of these of, of a economic development strategy of investing in these kinds of commercial industrial districts, investing in business development, and investing in uh, people, uh, developing their talents, and bringing these three pieces together at the community level to improve people's quality of life and ultimately their earning power that are coming out of poverty. Another um, tool that's kind of evolved out of this is land banking. We're going to hear more about the Detroit Land Bank here um, in a minute, but um, we have a small nonprofit that in the 90s, we, uh, LISC was involved in advocating for some state law changes to, to create the opportunity for land banking, but because of some things going on and how it was operated locally by government, uh, there was a need for this nonprofit to step in and take over the leadership of our land bank, and that has really accelerated uh, the reuse of, of vacant homes um, and uh, uh, for example in 2017 134 uh, tax foreclosed properties were resold and also over the last three years 267 houses were demolished that were beyond saving uh, with hardest hit funds by that same organization and now that organization is expanding into assembling land for commercial industrial expansion as well um, so Moving forward, all these these tools and these lessons from these neighborhoods, we have realized alignment is really critical. Uh, finding, getting uh, multiple parties, local government, state government, um, local economic development partners, community development organizations at the citywide level and neighborhood level to work together to deploy these kinds of partnerships. 
Um, the uh, so in the lessons, you know, this sort of I guess revised uh, strategy focuses on uh, c planning comprehensively, but really tightly targeting that, uh, building on these um, these partnerships and lessons. Uh, linking to other initiatives and celebrations as we did at the Super Bowl, but now looking for new opportunities to do that. Uh, creating efficiencies across the silos of these different types of economic development versus community development versus workforce development and bringing those together. Uh, leveraging infrastructure investments uh, and then um, recognizing that if our core neighborhoods are not strong, the city as a whole will not survive and this is critical that everybody work together on that. And so uh, Indianapolis is coming up on its 2020 bicentennial as a city, 200 years uh, since its founding. And we decided that this is a, a, our next big celebration to connect this neighborhood work to. And we're doing that through Great Places 2020, using many of the lessons learned from the Super Bowl Legacy Initiative. Uh, this is a visionary community development project to transform strategic places in five Marion County neighborhoods into dynamic centers of culture, commerce, and community preparing Indianapolis for unprecedented success as it enters 2020 and its third century as a city. Uh, what, what we're trying to do is create more places uh, like um, Fountain Square, which is one of our the neighborhoods we were talking about earlier. And what we realized is um, urban neighborhoods uh, are, are, are increasing what people are looking for, but not just uh, old residential areas. They're looking for mixed use centers where you can walk to amenities that are your day-to-day -day amenities without depending on getting back in your car. That's really the kind of urban uh, place that people are increasingly demanding and that we need to be able to deliver more. We don't have a lot of that in Indianapolis. Um, so, and we looked at how we go about um, creating more of these kinds of places, helping neighborhoods become these kinds of places. And there's really a, a it's gotta be a holistic approach. It's livability, which is about health and beauty of the neighborhood, opportunity, which is about entrepreneurship and jobs, Vitality, which is about growing the, the and basically housing, but making our housing more um, diverse in, it, in its type and who lives there and its affordability, and education, which is basically cradle to career opportunities to improve people's skills. Um, all those are critical for these areas to be successful and they need to be bundled together in one initiative. Uh, one key element is anchor institutions uh, are, are, are increasingly a part of these initiatives and each of these great places was selected in part because they had an anchor partner. Uh, this is a list of some of the examples of those, typically hospitals, universities, uh, also cultural organizations and sometimes large corporations. Um, just some examples of some of these is one is River West. It's a, um, the neighborhood commercial center, but it was kind of between two neighborhoods, uh, been really disinvested and didn't have really a name. So part of what we did is help them actually develop a brand for the area, this River West idea that was provided, um, we provided a, um, an ad agency to work with the community-based organizations to develop that branding. Um, but um, they, they, they've developed specific goals around livability, opportunity, vitality, and education. And ultimately this adds up for a vision for um, uh, how um, that this community sees itself changing. And one of the things that we learned from the quality of life planning is that um, we needed to focus more in a more tight area geographically. And so um, each of these is a quarter mile radius. That's a distance people will walk from sort of the main intersection. And you can see this is a rendering of one of the other great places. Last one is Englewood Village. Um, this is a neighborhood that was an old industrial area. It's also in the promise zone, as I mentioned. Um, this neighborhood, is reactivating industrial buildings for things like new charter schools, adding mixed income housing on a, on a future bus rapid transit stop, uh, as well as creating green space in, that's in a commons area that, that has not had in the past, but also doing non-physical development things like developing uh, businesses that, uh, growing businesses that employ more residents, bringing a high quality school to serve this area, um, and also um, working on lar other larger quality of life issues like just continuing to encourage more home ownership in this area and uh, improved uh, business environment for small businesses in the area. All these things deployed through a range of um, five different partner organizations that are working at the, at the citywide level, our Chamber of Commerce, our United Way, our city, LISC is acting as the backbone for this, another community development financial institution called INHP. Uh, and keep Indianapolis beautiful, all working together to provide different elements 
of development of these specific plans in these five great places. So those, those are just um, sort of the, that's the latest version of this long-term work. As Diane said, this does take a long time. Uh, it, we are continuing to realize that we need to stay focused on particular neighborhoods, but constantly update how we do that to use the latest tools. We're thinking about opportunity zones as a new way to raise capital locally and think how that can bolster these great places. And as we find new tools, we'll keep injecting them. But ultimately, it comes from the community owning and leading this work with, uh, with support of groups like LISC, and, but also linked into regional economic development strategy as sort of the, the engine that drives this kind of investment uh, in, at the neighborhood level. And here's my contact information if, if people would like more information on either Indianapolis or nationally LISC, uh, what we're doing like this in other places. All right, thank you, Bill. That was um, a, an abundance of information that you shared with us. And for those of you tuning in, if you have any questions for Bill or for any of our of our speakers, feel free to type those questions into the um, questions box and we'll get to those during the Q&A period. So Bill, we look forward to more discussion with you later. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our third speaker for the webinar, Mr. Bali Kumar. Uh, Bali is the executive director of the Wayne County Land Bank located in Detroit, Michigan. And Bali, he holds a great amount of expertise in helping um, create safer, stronger, and more prosperous neighborhoods throughout Wayne County. So welcome, Bali. Uh, would you like to share some more information about yourself with our audience today? Sure, thanks. Uh, I always start this, uh, this story about who I am with uh, since I'm not from Detroit, a lot of folks are like, "So why are you here? Like, w what's your interest?" Uh, I'm from I'm from Harlem, New York, uh, and I grew up in a in a neighborhood that was was quite blighted. Uh, and now I see what Harlem has become. Now uh, it's a place that you know even even I was priced out of at some point. Uh, and so you know, I see I've seen the transformation from from bright to blight, and I think. Uh, through through who I am and uh, going to school and studying ethnic studies uh, and developing sort of a framework and and uh, the words for the empathy that I wanted to enact uh, and then later on going to do a master's degree in management and uh, becoming a management consultant and and learning sort of the business acumen behind a lot of this stuff and then going to law school. Uh, and, and then being a lawyer in uh, in New York and then Los Angeles, uh, and starting to understand the the legal aspects of these things, uh, I, I got appointed to serve as the director of the Wayne County Land Bank. Um, to advance past this slide, um, okay. the first thing the first thing I'll mention. There we go. Uh, so yeah, the Wayne County Land Bank. We we fight blight. That's uh, that's one of our our key key mission uh, aspects. And so one thing I guess I'll say about the Wayne County Land Bank is that uh, the Wayne County Land Bank is not the Detroit Land Bank. The Detroit uh, the city of Detroit has its own land bank, uh, which has quite a number of parcels. I think the last time I checked it was ninety six thousand parcels. Um, and so I guess the city of Detroit is focusing uh, on on that that part of the uh, of the county, and the Wayne County Land Bank deals with the rest of the county. So Wayne County is 43 communities, Detroit being the largest, uh, and so we are focused more on out county. Although we do do some work in in Detroit, uh, the mission of the Wayne County Land Bank is that we really want to turn unproductive properties uh, and put them back into productive use. We, we really encourage development uh, and we discourage speculation. So we've seen there's, there's been a lot of speculation in the Detroit metro area. Uh, recently, there, there are lots of foreign investors who are interested in the revitalization of the Detroit metro area. And there are a lot of folks who have just been buying property and sitting on it, letting it remain blighted in the community. And that's something we want to we want to work against because that really hinders the development of the of the county. 
we want to put properties back in the tax rolls because uh, if nothing else, that that helps the county fund itself and provide necessary services to to the the members of the county. We want to either increase or at least preserve property values. Uh, there are some places where we can make positive impact uh, to increase the property values in the neighborhood. Uh, in some places, it's just about stopping the bleeding and and preserving property values so that way they don't continue to bottom out. And another thing we want to do is reinvigorate depressed communities. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time focusing on the parts of Wayne County that need the most help. There are there are parts of the county that are doing quite well. And so obviously I don't I don't spend the majority of my time there. All right. So more about the Wayne County Land Bank. Uh, the Wayne County Land Bank is a is a public corporation. We are the Wayne County Land Bank Corporation. We are a separate legal entity from the from the county. Uh, we were enabled by statute. So the state of Michigan has a statute called the Land Bank Fast Track Act that enabled the state to create a land bank and then enabled the state to enable uh, local jurisdictions to create their own land banks. Um, we are funded not by the county. Uh, we are funded by selling property in our inventory and the legislation provides that for five years, 50% of the property tax that is collected on a property that's sold out of a land bank uh, goes back into the land bank. So those are our major streams of revenue. Um, a lot of the properties we sell are blighted and are therefore don't generate much in sales or property tax going forward. Um, there are a, a few big projects that will generate bigger fees and that sort of helps us sustain ourselves. We also take administrative fees from some of our programs that I'll talk about later. Um, we are a small but mighty land bank here at the Wayne County Land Bank. We have uh, five employees, uh, me plus four, and and we really we're really working hard. And I think we have a really smart team, and I'm really appreciative for them. Uh, how do we take title to properties? Typically, we receive properties that are not sold in tax foreclosure auction. Um, so every year there is a tax foreclosure auction when a property is foreclosed. Um, the first auction, uh, the minimum bid is, is the amount of back taxes plus interest plus penalties. If it doesn't sell at that auction, there's a second auction that it could get sold at where the minimum bid is $500. And if it doesn't get sold at that auction, then it's offered to the communities, uh, and if the communities reject it, then it falls into the Wayne County Land Bank. That's why I say we are sort of the repository of last resort. You know, we're dealing with the the worst of the worst properties uh, and really trying to put them back into productive use. What does our inventory look like? Our inventory is mostly residential. Uh, out of the 1,300 properties that we have in our inventory at the moment, uh, I'd say over a thousand are residential and vacant, so vacant lots, uh, and about over 200 are residential and have structures. So we don't have much by way of industrial properties or commercial properties. We have a couple that come through our inventory, uh, but we don't focus there. We focus more on residential. Our programs. So we have a right of refusal pilot program. I'll talk about these programs going through the slides. We have a side lot program. We, we focus on compliance and we deal with occupied folks. Uh, we, we do some nuisance abatement work and we quiet title. Uh, we focus on some demolition when, when possible. And, and partnerships is, is something that I'm really focused on these days. I think together, together we can really fight the problem. I think in silos, uh, blight really continues to persist. So the, the right of refusal pilot program. Um, last year, the county worked with the Wayne County Land Bank to exercise the right of refusal on 141 properties. The way that the way the foreclosure process works is that after foreclosure, the state gets the opportunity to exercise a right of refusal. And if the state says, you know, no, we don't want this property, then the applicable city or township gets the opportunity to exercise a right of refusal. And if they don't want it, then the county 
uh, gets the opportunity to exercise a right of refusal. And if they don't want it, then it goes through these auctions that I spoke about earlier. If it doesn't sell at auction, you know, it gets uh, offered to the municipalities. If, it doesn't, if they say no, then it goes to the Wayne County Land Bank. Um, we, we did a pilot program. I think there were 6,000 uh, properties that were on their way to auction last year. So 141 properties the county exercised a right of refusal on. And there were 64 occupied residential properties, 77 uh, non-occupied and or non-residential properties. Uh, specifically focusing on the occupieds, 40 of the op occupants were given some sort of repurchase or lease option. Um, and 13 of them were given some sort of rehousing assistance. We really wanted to work with folks who, who were in the properties who may have been losing their homes. You know, there are some folks that we were working with who were renting and their landlord wasn't paying property tax. And so all of a sudden, you know, they're paying, they're paying rent to their landlord, their landlord is not fulfilling their obligations and they find out they're gonna get kicked out. You know, we think that's not an ideal outcome. We really want to uh, create, we wanna keep people in the community where possible. So we required that the people who obtain the properties through this right of refusal process had to work with eligible occupants under the program and had to offer some sort of repurchase or lease option and and in other cases you know try to give rehousing assistance to folks so we're not creating homelessness and vacancy um, for the properties that are not repurchased or leased then each of these properties are subject to a minimum investment uh, generally, that's about twenty-five thousand dollars per property. We want to. We really want to push for development and not speculation. If the properties were to go to auction, then and the properties could be picked up by someone. Uh, there'd be no minimum investment requirement. There'd be no requirement to to keep people in their homes. Um, there'd be no requirement to remediate blight. And so we think that our our pilot program. Was, was a very well thought out program and we learned from the pilot program last year and we wanna take it this year and make it a bigger, better program. Um, we have a side lot program. So we, we use our GIS mapping expert to determine who has an ad adjacent property to uh, a vacant lot that we have and we send them a letter and we say, hey, we would like to sell you this vacant lot for, let's say, $250 or $500, depending on uh, the health of the neighborhood. The more distressed the neighborhood, the, the cheaper the side lot they can get. I mean, it puts the property back into productive use. It gets it back uh, on the tax rolls. Uh, it shifts the burden of, of uh, maintenance, like cutting grass uh, to, to someone who has a vested interest in the property because they're right next door. <clears throat> We've seen people uh, put gardens on these side lots. We've seen people, you know, put up a, a garage for, for their cars on, on the side lots. If nothing else, it helps you expand your property line uh, for, for going forward. And we think this is sort of low hanging fruit. This is an easy win. Uh, uh, and so th this is a pretty successful program that we run. We have a compliance program. So whenever we sell a property through the land bank, uh, you know, through direct sale, we, especially if it's a if it's a structure, we have a purchase agreement. If it's side lot, no real purchase agreement uh, because it's it's you know it's 250 or 500 bucks. You know you, you mow the grass and you you do it you do what you like with it. But with uh with a with a structure or if you were to buy multiple properties, then we definitely have a blight remediation requirement. So if you buy a structure, you have to replace the windows. You you know fix the stairs if need be. Uh, fix the roof if need be, just so that way the outside of the house looks nice because when a house is blighted, it affects the properties to the left of it, to the right of it, in front of it, and back of it. It affects, you know, the entire block. Uh, and so we want to we want to do at least reasonable uh, beautification on the exterior. We don't monitor the interior. We let people work on that uh, at their leisure, at their own pace. Um, if someone's coming in or some entity comes in and wants to buy multiple properties, 
then we, we will require some sort of minimum investment to really give them some skin in the game. Uh, and so we might require if someone comes in and has four structures, a minimum investment of $60,000. So that way they're really working on, on uh, remediating blight on these properties and, and putting them back into productive use. Let's see, Occupy program. So again, uh, the land bank has a policy to prevent homelessness and prevent vacancy where possible. Instead, we really wanna give people who are able to afford it uh, and who are able to, to manage it a path toward home ownership. We believe that homeowners on properties help to preserve or, or even increase property values. Uh, homeowners are, are people who are, 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 have a vested interest in the community and, and you know, aren't necessarily going to sit around and let the, let the property fall into blight, at least while they're living there. Um, otherwise, uh, through our Occupy program, if, if someone doesn't have the capacity to purchase the house or, or, or at least maintain the house, um, or, you know, there are some properties that we have in our inventory that are in some sort of dangerous or uninhabitable state, uh, we will connect the occupant with nonprofit partners who can hopefully assist them with, uh, with rehousing so that way they can end up somewhere safe. We have a nuisance abatement program. Um, so the nuisance abatement program works in a way that a community will reach out. So one of our uh, 43 communities will reach out and say, hey, uh, we have these these uh, blighted properties in our neighborhood and they're privately owned. Um, could you file suit against these owners in order to force them, you know, get an injunction to force them to, uh, to remediate the blight? Uh, so we'll file the suit. If, uh, if someone is responsive to the injunction, that's fine, it's great. It means that blight is remediated in the community. Uh, if they don't, then the title to the property can transfer to the applicable city or municipality. We have an expedited quiet title program. And this is just something to, to aid in, in the development and, and clean up real estate property records because you know your property line may have shifted over time or someone may be encroaching on your property or you may be encroaching on someone's property. Uh, and, so we really just bring actions to quiet title so that way a court can establish uh, the party's title to the property of and against anyone and everyone. And so that quiets any challenges or claims to the title. Uh, it's something that allows a property to be uh, insured easier. Uh, and it's something that a lot of people are taking us up on. Uh, it's also a revenue generator for the land bank because we charge a fee for this service. But the, the good thing about quiet title for land banks is that our statute allows us to obtain clear title in an expedited time frame, so it's a 90 day time frame. And this is often, you know, we do it cheaper, we do it faster, we do it more efficiently than, you know, some folks who just go to lawyers in the community because our statute allows for the expedited time frame. Uh, partnerships, I'm huge on partnerships. I'm always looking for more partnerships. I think together we can we can really make impacts. Uh, we have partnerships with community groups. Uh, there's there's an individual in one of our most distressed neighborhoods who is trying to take her whole block on her shoulders. Uh, she she sponsors uh, an area in you know she she's acquired a bunch of property in her neighborhood. She has a, a homework area for people to come after school and have a safe place for, for you know, tutoring and whatnot. Uh, we, we donated some property to her, for instance. Uh, nonprofits, there's the United Community Housing Coalition. Uh, we work with them and they help us with, uh, with, with policy. You know, they, they weigh in on some of our policies, but they also help us with rehousing folks who, who need to be out of uh, homes that are in our inventory, but don't need to end up, uh, you know, on the street. We have partnerships with banks. Uh, recently, I met with two banks. One bank wants to provide uh, gap financing for rehabs for first responders and veterans. So we're trying to get a program off the ground whereby if, uh, 
if we have a rehab and it requires a hundred thousand dollars of work to get it into you know into sort of a habitable state for someone to move into but it can only be sold for eighty thousand dollars then this bank is willing to forgive forgive the, the twenty thousand dollar gap as part of their cra funds uh, another bank wants to work with habitat to build affordable housing on some of our vacant lots and uh as Diane alluded to earlier, with respect to focusing somewhere and sort of branching out, uh, you know, there, there's an entire neighborhood that this bank is focused on, and and they really just want to focus on one part of the neighborhood and maximize their impact within a few blocks, and then sort of trickle out from there, as opposed to, you know, focusing on all four quadrants of the neighborhood at once. Um, we're you know we're working with uh, we're working with a trade organization that that rehabs properties and you know we are willing to donate to them uh, a property so that way they can they can get practice because trade organizations require uh, you know a certain number of hours of practice in order to be certified uh, for individuals to be certified we work with the economic development corporation for the county on certain special projects uh, and land banks actually uh, there are statute allows us to do some special things. So when a property comes into the land bank's inventory, for instance, it automatically qualifies as a brownfield, and so that could unlock funding. Demolition. So we don't really have funds in our budget for demolition because as I stated earlier, we, we, get, we get our income off of uh, things that don't generate a tremendous amount of revenue and, and demolition is not cheap. Uh, but we are working on grant funds for the near future uh, we're exploring options uh, because we think it's important to demolish certain uh, properties that aren't salvageable, that are provided and sometimes are dangerous. Um, occasionally, uh, we will sell some properties through the land bank that weren't acquired through the tax foreclosure process, but will require demolition depending on the community needs. So some certain communities require demolition. Um, and you know as a as a part of you know what they want for the property to go through the land bank and, and we can mandate that through a development agreement um so yeah in conclusion please visit our website waynecountylandbank.com uh feel free to email me at dkumar at waynecounty.com i'd i'd love to continue conversation and i'm happy for for q a to start Thanks, Bali. Thanks for providing us with some information um, that you all are doing at the land bank. And at this time, um, I'd like to open um, the floor for questions from our audience. So feel free to get those questions in. Um, we have um, for our first question, and um, this is for any presenter. Can you discuss the conflict between concentrating efforts and funding in a small area for high impact versus equity of spreading funding across the wider community. So any thoughts on that? Um, and this is open to anyone. I guess I'll take that first. Um, we really, in Indianapolis, and this is true in most weak market cities, don't have the, the ability to change the market in very many places given the limited number of resources we have, and the only real opportunity to, to um, really re revitalize many neighborhoods is if the market is to come back to life, the, how, the home ownership market, the rental market, the business activity investment in the area, people choosing to invest there. And uh, that choice is gonna not be uh, affected by small amounts of money spread evenly across the community that's only gonna really be affected where people see something changing fairly quickly, very visibly, and that's why we choose to concentrate. It also, and it, uh, that kind of concentration also tends to attract other investments like a magnet, and I, that accelerates that kind of impact. Um, ultimately, we've found that you can move on to other places, that you don't have to stay in the same place forever, so you eventually uh, can move to other areas, but it's a choice between really not driving the market anywhere or at least in a few places and trying to pick those strategically so they have the, the greatest impact on the most people in the larger city. I think that's true. Um, it's very true, Bill. Uh, 
you know, whenever resources are limited, whenever resources are limited and people believe that, that, that this is all there is, um, it makes it very difficult to do something more than, than, than spread that money out. And of course, it's the, also the easiest thing to do politically, to spread that money out um, over uh, each alderman's district, for example. Um, and, and that appears, there is some appearance of fairness there. But it's very difficult, as, as Bill's saying, to make any kind of impact that way. So what, what, what you hope to be able to do is to, is to recognize that fact that we can't make an impact um, in this way. Let's talk about, um, let's really drill down into the data, see where the opportunities are ready, um, and see who can get ready um, to best use these resources and begin to stage resources over time. I mean, it is, it's, it's tough to get that kind of agreement that people have to trust you and you have to build that trust in the community that in fact, at one point, it will be your turn if you agree to, to um, allow uh, resources to go into one place or another. Um, but the best way is to, to, to use your best data sources, uh, to engage the community in a, in uh, a very deliberate way and to, to try to get to that point where they trust you enough and, and they, are, they understand they have to be ready to use those resources the best way possible. But then also, it's just as Bali is saying about partnerships, um, draw, take those resources that you have, those limited resources, and, and use those to leverage um, more abundant resources from other sources. Yeah. I'll, I'll also chime in. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to focus on, I think, the difference between equality and equity, right? So uh, you, can, you can spread resources equally, uh, or you can spread resources equitably. So uh, in Wayne County, there are 43 municipalities. Certain, certain municipalities don't really need any support from the land bank, and certain need almost all of our support. And so the equitable distribution of my, my team's resources is to focus on where it needs the most support, not spread it, spread it around equally. Okay, thanks, Bali. And actually, um, this next question is for you. Um, what is the bank providing the gap um, financing? Is it a national or a local bank? Um, it's, it is, I guess, a national bank, but has like a very, very strong local presence or at least presence around the state of Michigan. Um, and so basically, I think they receive money from the Federal Home Loan Bank. And part of what they can do through the Federal Home Loan Bank is support local initiatives. Okay. All right, and um, this question is open to anyone on our panel. Um, what recommendations do you have with regard to getting community members on board when you're working in a lower income neighborhood with limited resources? Well, I think number one is food. Um, you, have, you have food, you offer food, you go to a comfortable place, uh, if you have a community center or a neighborhood center uh, right in the middle of that neighborhood or, or even just another uh, a restaurant or, or, or another space within that neighborhood where you can be um, so that you're on, on their turf, so to speak, um, you're going to gain better encouragement um, and engagement. Um, we actually, you know, walked up and down the neighborhood streets and talked to folks at, um, from their, in their houses and, and at community events and, and um, activities and encourage people to participate in that way. But you have to get out to, you have to get out to them and encourage them to, um, to, to partner with their neighborhood, their neighbors and work with you. I would add that you need to work with trusted organizations uh, that are from a community. If you are an outside organization investing there or a regional or a citywide organization, uh, finding a good community-based or multiple community-based partners 
a CDC or a community center or a neighborhood organization um, that is a healthy organization. Not all groups make good partners or not all groups are well connected to their own communities, but um, picking a good partner that does have those kinds of relationships, supporting their engagement of the community in the work, including financially supporting that sometimes, and, uh, and then being willing to uh, really have them have an equal say in what's happening or a strong say at least in that so what the ideas that come out of that engagement are really owned by the community uh, that, that their ideas not their um, someone else's organi organization's ideas being imposed on the community those are all uh, critical if the in, if the neighborhood development in low-income communities is going to be sustainable that community needs to feel like it's their vision and their responsibility to drive that forward and that, that means that you've got to partner with them on priorities priorities that they establish yeah I'll, I'll also add uh, trying to develop trust is, is sort of a tricky situation is based on things that may or may not matter in real life but uh, the first impression might matter so uh, prior to my joining the land bank uh, the land bank was a team of five white people and so going into a neighborhood that is poor and black, there wasn't this initial level of trust, and it was sort of a hurdle to overcome. Um, and so just being cognizant of, of things like this, um, I think matter, because it's, it, it could impede or, or create trust. Uh, so, you know, I have, I have people who go around and knock on doors and try to, try to house or at least work with occupied folks that are in blighted properties, you know, I encourage people to, you know, wear jeans and a sweatshirt when you're when you're going on knocking on doors. Uh, don't wear khakis and a polo shirt. You know, just the little things I think can help engender trust. Thanks, everyone. Um, so our next question um, is actually for Bally. Um, what is the legal mechanism for the nuisance abatement program? Can you go into more detail about that? Um, yeah, I can go into some more detail. Uh, I'd have to go to my general counsel for that more, but uh, basically the the land bank sues uh, on behalf of the municipality and it goes to court and the, the judge, you know, rules uh, hopefully in our favor and then there's an injunction placed against each owner uh, that, that is ruled against and that owner must comply with the injunction. So if they're enjoined and required to remediate blight and then sort of come back to the court with pictures showing that they remediated blight, uh, then that that's how it sort of plays out. Okay, and then um, we have a follow-up question for you. Um, how many properties are banked annually and how much of your inventory is redeveloped annually? Um, so I'd say in the past year and a half-ish, we've returned over 500 properties uh, back into productive use. Um, it really depends, like what we receive really depends on, on the auction process. And for a while, uh, the land bank was, was dormant and wasn't really utilized. So last year we received something like 1750 properties that were in the treasurer of the county's inventory because the treasurer forecloses and then was just sitting on these properties um this year we expect to receive something like 400 ish properties from uh last year's foreclosure auction but it really depends on what doesn't sell at the uh at the foreclosure auctions and what the communities don't want to take. So there are certain communities in, in Wayne County that after the second auction, they'll take all the properties so that way they don't go to the land bank because they want to deal with them locally. Certain communities will always reject them and prefer that the land bank uh, deal with these properties so that way they can focus on other things in the city. But more and more cities may end up taking all of their properties after the auctions and dealing with things locally. So it really depends year by year. 
Okay, thanks. Um, our next question, um, it can be open to our panel, um, but um, maybe we could start off with Bill for this one. Um, have you explored alternate land uses? So for instance, going from um, residential to commercial or industrial to bring job creation growth to the surrounding residential areas and um, potentially grow retail in the process. Um, that certainly happens. There's really no such thing in the neighborhoods we work in as a purely residential area or purely commercial or, or even sometimes purely industrial. A lot of these uses are mixed together. Um, sometimes that works well uh, and sometimes uh, the, the proximity of the residential to the industrial leads to different kinds of ways of using industrial. We have a, a a building we're working on that has about half a million square feet in it was originally an auto parts manufacturing uh, plant and now has 84 different businesses in it. Um, and they range from light manufacturers to a brewery to uh, a place that makes custom furniture to a t-shirt screening company, um, many different uses. and. Ultimately, what it's a, is the diversification of, of the of the economy of that neighborhood, and a lot of people from that community work there. So uh, it's it is a it is still technically an industrial use in many ways, but is a change of use in the way that the kinds of industry, the the way the um, the businesses are structured there. Um, well, the other thing that I was mentioned earlier, our land bank is has realized that some of these industrial districts have some awkward juxtapositions of residential and industrial or industrial properties that would be much more valuable or useful if they were larger or connected to another piece and in between there's another piece of property and so we're getting to the point where we're starting to look at really assembling land consolidating uses for larger parcels to make them more useful and marketable that's new um, we've actually just raised some credit enhancement dollars so LISC will be able to uh, lend money for that kind of uh, speculative purchase um, in, when, when it's not too speculative. <laughs> um, but um, ultimately, uh, I think that there are times when you do need to consolidate a use and make it a little bit bigger or eliminate a conflict in use. But really what we're finding is these, these things are blending together more because of just the changing nature of the businesses that are interested there. I guess the other thing I would say is commercial is generally shrinking right now. I mean, certainly retail is. So, you know, how commercial districts are used is are is shifting, and the line between retail and making things, and even residential, is getting blurrier as well because of that. I think that's a really good point about it. It all really getting a, a bit blurrier. I think one thing that that is happening is that we have a, a mismatch in housing supply and housing demand. So even if you have the, the right number of units of housing and, and demand for that housing, what you're having is it's, it's people are not finding the housing that they want uh, in the kind of environment that they want. So it does mean that there is um, a real push and a real need in a lot of communities to transform some of the single family homes that exist, um, use that opportunity if some are blighted, et cetera, use some opportunity there to create um, more of a central place where you're going to have a good mix of perhaps um, uh, apartments, condominiums, commercial, uh, some recreational opportunities that blend into say the center of a, of a larger neighborhood uh, providing some more of that walkability that Bill was talking about earlier that doesn't always exist in all uh, in all communities. So it's a, a transformation of what exists there so that you end up with housing that's much more like what people want today. All right, thanks. Um, for our next question, um, and actually Diane, this one is for you. Um, going back to um, when you were mentioning even using paint as a uh, a strategy to address blight. Um, how large of an area was initially repainted and what was the cost investment? Do you happen to remember? 
I can't tell you the total cost investment. They were talking about, um, I did ask specifically about where the money came from. Uh, this is not my own project. Uh, it was a project of the, the Searcy community, uh, Chamber, uh, Main Street, uh, as, as well as some local investment. Uh, they um, really just used, they used resources pretty much on hand. It was a combination of, of excess grant money that they had, some individual uh, donations. Uh, I don't recall whether there was any city money uh, in there, and I can't tell you how much the investment was, but we're really talking about just a few blocks. Uh, Searcy is a small community, uh, so we're only talking about a few blocks. And it's uh, the primary main downtown where they started. So the so probably around four block faces is where they started, and then they built out from there after they were having some success. Thanks, Diane. Um, this question is open to anyone on our panel. Um, so what if um, the resident or whoever has the blighted property, um, what if they don't have an appetite for improvement? So what if they don't want change or anyone telling them that their property needs improvement? Um, how would you go about addressing that? Well, it, it depends on how pervasive that, that feeling is. If that, if that feeling is, is pervasive in the community, then the community is probably not ready for a lot of, of, of new ideas. And, and so it, it really is important that you think about doing some things that are, uh, that kind of ease, ease folks into it. Um, change of any kind is, is uncomfortable. And so sometimes what you have to do is, is ease people into it with easy things. Uh, and you might start up with just some cleanup fix up in a neighborhood. You might just start up with a clean with a neighborhood beautification initiative where everyone doesn't have to participate. But once somebody cleans up their property or when somebody participates in a paint program, for example, um, that that you get um, you see how it really does make it really does make a difference. Just that small change does make a difference. And sometimes that simply encourages people to do it. Other times, um, you know, a, a, a carrot is not a bad thing. And so providing some incentives, uh, whether that's a 50-50 a match for, for a facade improvement or, or some free paint to folks, those things can really, uh, can really matter, actually. Very small incentives can matter uh, to encourage folks to participate in a program. I think this is another um, example of what well, a benefit of a Partnership with a community-based organization uh, can, is is really very uh, important. Ultimately, there might, if it was purely a politically driven process, one loud, one or two loud people who don't want something to happen can sometimes stop it because of the political sensitivities, um, or or maybe push it to somewhere else. But the neighbors of those couple of people, if they want to see change are not gonna let a couple of people stop that change from happening. And um, we'll come out and support the change happening around the, 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 the opposition. And maybe a few things, you know, people hold out, there'll be holdouts, but uh, with the rest of the community can still progress uh, when there is that sort of strong community drive to, to see it happen. Yeah, and the land bank, so different land banks have different uh, blight remediation requirements. So for instance, the, the Detroit Land Bank requires you to bring the property up to code, which is a, a pretty exacting uh, process. And so the Wayne County Land Bank purposely uses a, a bit of a lower bar and just requires blight remediation on the exterior of the property. And we find that this is reasonable and doable uh, within a 90 day time frame. So whereas, you know, it, it could take a long time to bring a property up to code. Uh, it doesn't take a terrible amount of time to remove any debris that's in the grass in front of your house and, and mow the lawn once, uh, once in a while, or and repair the broken windows, which is something you probably want to do anyway because we have winter. Uh, and and you know, fix fix uh, fix holes in the roof because again, winter. Um, so we we try to use really reasonable standards for blight remediation. 
Thanks, everyone. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, this one's an interesting question, and I'll open this up to the panel. Um, if you had 100 plus acres of vacant land in the middle of a 250,000 population area, what would you create? And how critical would you rely on public input to establish a vision for this area? That's a, I, I think that's a tough one to answer in a generic sense, but in general, something should be, a, uh, it's an opportunity to do something creative and dynamic, um, but, and so that tends to lead toward a, a few people or maybe even one person having a great idea, but the reality is that a great idea is never going to happen if there isn't community, broader community support in the middle of a community like that with that much land. It's going to require a lot of resources to ever become a reality. So I think it's going to have to be both. Um, you're, it's, you're going to have to look for great ideas and gener you know, engage the entrepreneurs and the, and the creative uh, development folks that are in the community, um, uh, including people who maybe have a vision of, for a park or some less, uh, not you know, basically people who are going to come at this from different directions, look for creative ideas. But ultimately, if they're not vetted and fully supported by a broader portion of the community, they're probably never going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I'm a, I'm a big fan actually of, of RFPs, like RFPing things out and, uh, you know, requesting proposals. Uh, and, and I'm also a big fan of, of taking proposals to the community and, and doing community meetings and hearing from folks. Uh, because I think the people who respond to RFPs are different from folks in the community who will have opinions, but but aren't in the position to respond to an RFP. I think those are really strong responses. Um, it, I think the idea of the two-pronged approach makes sense. It's got to be community-driven. It's got to be community um, accepted, invested in, loved. Um, but I think bringing in some outside resources to get uh, to get some ideas and and thinking is is a good idea too. And I think that two prong strategy uh, is probably the way you uh, the way you need to go. Um, and it could be anything. You know, think about what it is you really would like to see in your community. That's a lot of property. It could go any direction. It could be um, a park. It could be recreation. It could drive. Uh, resources with some kind of partnership with the university and and local businesses and 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 small uh, tech companies. It could be any number of things. There are all kinds of directions it could go. It's got to fit in your community. So get some great ideas from outside, um, and then you know really work it in the community. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we've had some really um, engaging question and questions and uh, discussion during our Q&A segment. Um, so this has been very insightful. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left for our webinar. So before we close, um, I do have um, a couple of announcements that I would like to make. Um, first, we have, um, we have an, a webinar next week, Economic Development Week Strategies and Award-Winning Tips. Um, National Economic Development Week will be May 7th through 12th this year, and it's a way to really um, bring more attention to what you're doing throughout the profession and your communities, um, even getting your local um, elected official, officials engaged. And so we'll hear some strategies as well as some tips from some of our award winners from last year. So feel free to tune in next week, Thursday, March 15th, and the webinar will start at 2.30. Um, and then next month we have um, our webinar, Cultivating a Great Outdoor Recreation Economy. So that'll be Thursday, April 12th, again, starting at 2.30. Um, for those of you who will attend our Fed Forum conference coming up at the end of the month, um, we do have a training course, Neighborhood Development Strategies. That'll be March 22nd through 23rd. So again, right here in DC. Diane's actually, like I mentioned, one of the instructors for the course. Um, Diane, did you have any tidbits of information you'd like to share for anyone who's going to attend? I do, I do. Um, we have a really great team for the Neighborhood Strategies course. Uh, we've got Mark Barbash, who is kind of a, uh, a finance and real estate guru. We've got uh, Larissa Ortez, 
who is a really wonderful and passionate about commercial development. She's from New York, so she's also hard as nails. Um, the, the course, um, this is a, an interesting course if you've taken some of our other kinds of, uh, of courses. Uh, this one really attracts a good mix of small towns, big cities, uh, urban, rural. It's a very diverse group. Um, it's also a really fun class. We have lots of conversation, lots of interaction. Uh, we encourage people to bring their challenges to the course and we allow everybody to kind of workshop through those through some of those challenges so we get uh, good ideas from all all kinds of uh, different sources so it's um, as I say it's a it's a fun course to do and we'd encourage you to come join us for uh, later in the month or next time we have it all right sounds great so we're definitely looking forward to that um, so to our speakers today, as well as to all of our attendees, we thank you. Um, so again, feel free to visit our website to view our listings of um, upcoming webinars. If you have any questions, you can contact us, webinar at iebconline.org. And usually before we go, I like to give the speakers just one last chance if they have any final remarks. Um, so Diane, we'll go ahead and start with you. Any final comments for our guests today? Think big, start small, act fast. All right, and then um, how about Bill? Any final comments? You, I would recommend people reach out to the nearest LISC program. Uh, if you go to LISC.org, there is a map of all the country and there's both rural and urban programs that can help you look at resources in a creative way in your community. All right, and then last but not least, Bali, any final bits of advice for our, our attendees? Again, I harp on partnerships. I think there's so many ways to get creative with partnerships. And like, even if somebody can provide just something so small, it could be so crucial. Well, there you go. All right, well, thanks, everyone. And um, hopefully, we'll see you at next week's webinar. Thanks.